gathering from all over the world. We, I think in the chat, if you look through the chat, you'll see many, many different countries represented. And we're so excited to be part of um, this dialogue with the author, with uh, Rick and Simon. The Ataus Institute is a nonprofit educational organization. We're actually a virtual organization. And um, we offer uh, quite a big publishing um, section to our organization. And this book is part of what we call World Share Books which are free download books. And we're so excited for this to be our most recent, our newest book in the World Share Book Series. We also have conferences and workshops and online courses. Uh, we offer these free dialogue with the authors once a month. Um, and they, these are wonderful times to get together and, and learn about what's new in the world um, around social construction and change practices. I am going to turn it over to Rick and Simon to run the rest of the meeting and um, be in dialogue with each other. So again, I just welcome everyone from wherever you are in the world, and uh, we hope you enjoy this time together. Thanks very much, Dawn, and well, well, well managed with very little bandwidth. That was and Rick. I don't know if you wanted to just say a couple of words by way of introduction. I imagine. Some people may know you already, but. Uh... Yeah, uh, well, uh, some people know me, other people don't. I know some people, I don't. I'm very happy to be here to see people from all over the world. Uh, I'm here in Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, well, I'm looking forward to share a bit of our work here. Um, uh, what this is all about, uh, as Dawn uh, said, it's about a book that we published in the Taos World Share series. And what we want to be doing here is just give you a little bit of an overview, a story about how that came about, how we got into working, and then uh, it will lead to the book and uh, we'll give you some ideas about what it's all about. Simon? Yeah, and uh, my name's Simon. I'm in Oxford, um, UK, and Rick's going to tell you a little bit about how we met as that sort of part of the story of our, our working together. Um, but yeah, I, I um, work as an organizational consultant. Um, we work for a small, uh, small group uh, called Metalog for about the last five years. Um, and prior to that, worked at Ashridge Business School and Ashridge Consulting, um, but particularly interested in um, you know, different, different practices that can perhaps stretch how we work as OD practitioners and some of the artistic and creative thinking was you know, where, where Rick and I originally met and began um, you know, this, this adventure, these conversations, and ultimately this, this piece of writing. So looking forward to sharing that with you a little bit um, today. And we've got some slides, but we won't sort of bore you to death with slides, but we wanted to sort of share, share the history of, of how we got to where we are today, but perhaps um, as quickly as we can really get you into some small groups and, and allow you to perhaps have a bit of a play and a bit of an experiment um, yourselves as well. Um, but that's the plan for today. Um, so hopefully that's okay with you. Rick, shall I, shall I put the slide up? Do you want to sort of just yeah. share a little bit about where we began? There's a kind of couple of couple of images here, which perhaps give yeah, you a sense all, of that. It all started, uh, well, a bit about my background. I'm a musician and musicologist uh, by nature. I studied musicology a long time ago uh, here in, uh, in, in Holland which was about music, but also about psychology, uh, social, all, all kind of developmental um, psychology, everything connected with music, but also with uh, transdisciplinary research, all kind of things, mainly around creativity. So I was uh, thinking at a moment, I heard about this guy called Stephen Nakmanovich. I wrote a wonderful book called Free Play, and it was my favorite present to anyone. I had about five of those in the house, and every, every time I thought, hey, there's a birthday, I just took a, a copy of Free Play. And then I heard that Stephen would be working, uh, doing a workshop in Berlin uh, next week. Do you know next week there's going to be a workshop of Stephen? So I thought, that's wonderful, and I could uh, apply, and I went there. And uh, when I went there, uh, I met Simon. I haven't, uh, I didn't uh, hear of Simon or any people. It was about, how many people were there? About seven or eight? It depends which day. There were more to begin with, but we, we became yeah. fewer in number quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Just at the, at the yoga studio uh, at the, the, the Spree, which is like a, uh, um, what is it, a, a river or, or something in, um, in Berlin. And um, 
it already started in a way that we sensed wow this is this is this is wonderful because it always it was all about say serendipity free play improv so i brought my a guitar like a very light guitar and an amplifier but what um steven also was sharing with with us uh, you can bring your your instruments but you you're not going to be playing in a normal way <laughs> So we thought, how I'm going to play that thing. And that we arrived there and it was a few days. It was really wonderful uh, around improvisation, around creativity, but all more from the experience. What are we doing? We use things uh, from theater, from from acting, uh, all, all, uh, all kinds of things. But it was not strictly planned. It was more like a light framing and we played with that. And from that experience, Simon and me started to talk about... Um, we, we found out we like uh, music and uh, we're into consulting. I was also into consulting, change and innovation, leadership stuff. So we thought that's interesting. But what's also interesting is Gregory Bateson, because Gregory Bateson seemed to be someone uh, Stephen was, uh, um, uh, was studying with uh, Gregory Bateson. And uh, we thought that's interesting. I was reading about Bateson. Simon was reading about Bateson. We like music. So after the session, we went home and then we started to talk uh, uh, online about uh, all these things. Like we got Bateson, we got Miles Davis. What would happen if we hold these uh, alongside each other and see what emerges? Just in a playful way, not thinking in any way around we're going to do this um, uh, like um, uh, uh, in a way that's going to lead to something. So that, that was more the way we went, uh, we, we met. And what happened after that, so I'm, Mm. So the, the role of serendipity was there as well, because I, I was living in Berlin at the time, so perhaps it was a bit closer to B, but um, my colleague at Metalog, Kevin Power, put me onto it, um, and he spent a lot of time, you know, his doctorate uh, around Bateson, and he knew Stephen as a result of that, and, and yeah, Bateson seems to be behind, uh, behind a lot of this work, but um, uh, it was him that, that forwarded the email onto me, and, and we kind of began there, and that was our, I guess, our first metaphorical experiment, really, putting these two disparate bodies of work together and just being interested in, in what sparked out. Um, but what followed was a series of kind of Skype conversations where we, we kind of went all over the place and we were interested in trying to share some of it and realised it was sort of you know, deeply not linear and actually really quite confusing and difficult to share. Um, but after a number of years of kind of talking and thinking, um, there is a bit of a bit of a lineage of, of where we got to um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the jumping off point, I guess, for this piece of writing. So we just wanted to share a few slides here, which perhaps um, they don't do it justice, but give you a sense of you know, some of the, the thinkers, the writers, the organizational practitioners that have, have influenced us and, and where we ultimately got to. Um, and then Rick, Rick will talk a little bit about the kind of creative constraint, I guess, that we set ourselves with, with the book um, and perhaps give you a bit of a flavour of it for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to download it. Um, but we were particularly influenced um, uh, to kind of get writing something by a number of sort of frames, really. Both of us shared a bit of a frustration um, of the narrowness of perspectives that we often come across in our, in our work, in our lives, in our family lives. Um, uh, and we're interested in this idea um, of the way that uh, how we uh, shape, um, so how we perceive things is very shaped by our language, by our metaphors, by the frames that we're set. So Gareth Morgan, Images of Organization, not, not a new work by any means, but very, very influential. This idea that all theories of organization and management are based on implicit metaphors that lead us to see, understand and manage organizations in distinctive yet partial ways. Um, and this partiality, I guess, is unavoidable, but we were interested in the fact that a, a, it, it's hard for a lot of people to realize that they're viewing things from partial perspectives and it can be quite freeing um, if we can find ways of inviting people to, to see things from different perspectives. So that was a kind of an itch, I guess, a bit of a frustration. And then at the time when we started writing, it was the beginning of the pandemic. And um, you, again, we were starting to kind of hear these tired old metaphors, really. You know, there were lots of, you know, going to war on the virus and all of these things where it felt, felt a bit sort of futile, but understandable um, in some way, shape or form. So there was a kind of frustration there. Another important frame to us, um, you may or may not have come across is from um, Heron and Reason, who, who uh, did a lot of their work out of the University of Bath in the UK. But they were interested in alternative ways of knowing things. Um, and in a, in a nutshell, hopefully not doing them a disservice, um, the dominant ways that we know things in organisations have historically been propositional, so theoretical um, or practical, just by you know, doing a job a number of times. Um, and other ways of knowing are available. Um, so the experiential way of knowing, so tapping into the idea of phenomenological thought, um, but also the presentational. So just beyond that experience, that idea of kind of artistic, intuitive, creative knowing. 
Um, and we were realizing that you know, not only were we trapped in a dominant perspective, but we were trapped in dominant ways of knowing and, and perhaps something that connected our work over the years, even if we hadn't given it language, was a desire to work a bit more intuitively, a bit more artistically, a bit more creatively. Um, so those were kind of guiding, guiding instincts or, or spurs, I guess, to, to kind of get us going. Um, and then the next few slides really are the kind of lineage of, of how we got to the frame that we explored um, in the book, which is this idea of sound as an alternative metaphor. Um, but one of the jumping off points was Ralph Stacey's work on complexity in organisations, again, are not new, but, but sort of deeply influential in this idea of organisations as complex responsive processes. So they're collaborative in nature, participative in nature. We're weaving um, uh, our, our organisations or our societies um, together. Um, as we interact and our different intentions collide or chime with one another, um, whatever you want there. Um, so that participative sense of um, enabling and constraining each other. Um, and Stacey draws quite a lot on George Herbert Mead and, and Norbert Elias around power and constraint as well, just to give them their due um, as the lineage goes back. Um, and then building on Stacey's work, a colleague of his, Patricia Shaw, again sort of working out of the University of, of Hertfordshire and their complexity centre, this idea that organising is conversational process and organisational change, one way of framing it metaphorically, is shifts in the patterning of conversation. Um, so this is sure sort of nudging us in the direction of um, dialogic processes in organisations and, and you know, conversation is an audible uh, an audible thing. Um, so we're moving slightly in the direction of sound. And Shaw also uh, uh, quotes um, the, this idea of organisations being um, a game of ensemble improvisation. So you can see already that the, uh, the signpost is nudging us in the direction of where we ended up with the particular book. And then another kind of key influence was um, Klaus Otto Scharmer, um, based out of the US now, but German originally. Um, uh, and sort of quite well known for his uh, Presencing Institute, which some of you may well have come across, and lots of interesting creative practices there. Um, uh, and he has this quote around what the work of organisational consulting is, and he says it's about helping the system sense and see itself, which really chimed with us in, in, in the sense of not focusing too obsessively on some distant point B in the future, but really being curious about what is going on at the moment in organisational life. Um, so very much it almost perhaps an anthropological lens on organization. Let's get curious about the, the unusual things that we're doing together and then maybe later ask ourselves the question, you know, which of these are, are helpful and which are unhelpful. Um, so that is a, a bit of a theory of change. But we noticed that his metaphor here is, is visual. It's about sight um, rather than about any of the other senses. So again, with Patricia Shaw in our ear talking about conversation and listening, um, we wondered, you know, what would happen if we took this idea of not helping an organization sense and see itself, but perhaps allowing organizations, teams, societies to, to hear themselves um, and working with this sound metaphor. And then at some point, you know, one of us had this working, working quote, organization is pattern sound and music pattern sound in time. So we thought if sound is interesting, um, music as a heightened form of sound could be a rich metaphor to experiment with. And um, yeah, that's what we started to, to do. Um, so Rick, perhaps you want to say a little bit about the, the um the houdini chains we set ourselves or how we how we set up a bit of a frame for the book i guess yeah well um when you uh, when i started to study musicology i was also a, a musician and when you're a musician and a musicologist you wear two different hats so as a musician you're constantly in uh, as an improvising musician you're in the game you're in the gig always so you're always aware of this is what i'm doing and i'm playing with all kinds of things with uh, sounds and with uh, voices and with conversations and with patterns that's what you do as a musicologist uh, you, you're supposed to be a scientist so there there are some ideas about how can you frame this thing called music in such a way that you can explore it and you can learn from it and also you can learn from it in a metaphorical way so then the, one of the first things uh, that people told me about musicology is you can look at music from four different perspectives or four different aspects of it that play together, which are melody, harmony, rhythm and tone. And then, of course, when you, that is a starting point and then you start playing with that and you start to zoom in and zoom out, zoom out and you start to sense many connections. But this is a framework that has been used a lot in musicology, at least where I was studying which is a helpful way to looking at how do these things interact? How does melody interact with harmony? How does harmony in interact with rhythm and tone? So when we were talking about uh, our idea of how might music, musicology be 
uh, be connected with the organizational ideas, mainly the ideas also around Patricia Shaw, patterns of communications, uh, someone, Joao just mentioned CMM, like patterns of communication, how does that play into each other? And then we thought, wow, it might be interesting to just, um, um, instead of the overarching thing of music and sound as something that might be um, uh, a way to explore it, how can we like um, uh, look at it in a practical uh, way more from the perspective of melody? What are the melodies in the organization? What are the harmonies? What's the rhythm? What's the tone? And for me, that worked wonderfully. Like when I was working with uh, uh, organizations, what's your groove? You know, what's your rhythm? And, and what does that mean if you look at it like that? So that's when we started to play with these ideas and we, we use them as a way to uh, to frame our work around the practical, uh, the practices we use in our work from this um, from this framework. Okay, and we're just going to give you a couple of ex examples really and then we'll probably try and get you into conversation with one another. Um, and Rick, you're doing a good job of keeping an eye on the chat there because I'm bad at multitasking, but I think there's a few things popping okay. up there. Yep. Um, so there's some questions around CMM. I don't know if you just want to, to I'm not sure everyone's familiar with CMM. You're, you're better placed to, to answer that than I am. Yeah, I can, I can add some words for that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working for the CMM Institute. I'm uh, the board of that. And it means coordinated management of meaning, which is about co a social construction. It's about uh, patterns of communication uh, and um, looking at communication as, as um, uh, not as a way of uh, uh, the send and receive a model, like I got an idea and I'm going to transport it to your head, but zooming out and looking at the, co uh, the communication as perspective on what you're doing actually and what does it do. So make to make a, a little slight um, connection to what's happening with uh, with an improvising musician. If I'm playing on stage with a band, I do two things at the same time. I might play a note, like a uh, fire up a guitar. If I play something. Mm -hmm and I play with a band, I might play this. And I think, is this a cool lick? Yeah, but that's one thing. But what is uh, just as important, what does that lick do to, do to the gig? So we have the, uh, for instance, the band is playing this. Then this is wonderful. But if the band is playing this, and then it starts to play this, and I still play this, then something happens that is, uh, from a communication perspective, uh, not cool because I'm not helping the communication, the, the, the flow of all the music making, it's just lousy. So I, I pay attention to what I'm doing, what is it, but mainly what does what I do do, sounds weird, what does I do do to the group? And then, um, Dawn is mentioning that it's popping up. The Taos Institute, uh, there are many people who are connected to it, has two, uh, some wonderful books on CMM. And there's cmminstitute.org, that's the website, so you can go there. There are, uh, it's patterns of communication and uh, music that is deeply connected. So that's... Uh, yeah, put, the, put, the, put the links in there as well. So do, do go and have a look at those. They're, they're great publications. I've got a few on my shelves behind me. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've, we've got this kind of creative constraint, this framework of melody, harmony, rhythm and tone, and that's the four central book chapters of the book are structured around that. But we wanted to make this, you know, um, as practical as possible as well. So in those kind of four central chapters, we tried to share, um, you know, experiences from our practice over the years. Um, uh, and you know, very much things that perhaps take seriously this idea of artistic ways of knowing, but also um, the experiential nature of being in organisations. So we thought we'd just give you a kind of an example each. Um, uh, and then you know, perhaps move towards getting you uh, thinking about your own organizational challenges and, and sharing some examples. Um, but if in the book, if you've downloaded it, you'll notice um, there's this icon in the top right, um, which those of you who are very eagle-eyed might rep recognize as the uh, chord riff from So What on Kind of Blue. Um, but those practices, uh, those icons, you know, are, are different sections where hopefully there's stuff that you can kind of take and try out and adapt yourselves. We want it to be as practical as well as, as academic here. Um, but I'll just stop sharing there. But the example that stood out for me as I was thinking back on, on some of the examples we've used was this very heady sounding idea of um, Fourier analysis. And Fourier analysis is something Rick mentioned to me, actually. Is it's a process, really, of breaking down a sound uh, into its constituent sine and cosine ways. My goodness, I've bored myself saying that. Um, but it's this idea that um, if you took the note from an oboe, 
um, you can break it down and you can isolate the dominant sound wave. Um, and a lot of this came about when synthesizers were, were new and being developed and people were trying to create keyboards which had these accurate sounds on. Um, and there was a school of thought that said, you know, rather than have to um, get this you know, dirty complex sound of an oboe, you can clean it up. And if you just isolate the dominant sound wave, um, that would be much simpler to reproduce. But they noticed when they reproduced the dominant sound wave, the dominant tone of the oboe, unfortunately, it sounded nothing like an oboe. And indeed, any other instrumental sound that they recreated in this way sounded nothing like it. Um, so it was this idea almost that um, uh, uh, partiality or, or not being our sort of full selves with all of our tonal complexities is something that you sometimes get uh, emphasised in organisations. There can be an expectation in dominant uh, organisational cultures that you leave a lot of who you are um, at the, the office door, really, and you turn up as your dominant, useful tonal constituent. Um, but just thinking about this, this kind of metaphor of how that's, you know, you're not, you're not fully oboe, you're not fully yourself if you, if you trap off all of these different aspects of your personality. So it became a bit of a metaphor that we use quite a lot in um, perhaps some of the more individual work that we've been doing with leadership um, and your people in teams thinking about um, how, can you, um, how can you generate a team environment where people are uh, not just being their dominant tones, you know, their chief finance officer or their chief risk officer or uh, audit professional, whatever it might be, but allowing some of their overtones uh, in, some of the qualities that make them sort of deeply human and deeply themselves. And it made us think of um, a quote from Bateson about um, never trust a person or never vote for a person who is neither um, a poet, an artist or a bird watcher. Um, and there's something sort of deeply suspect about uh, people to Bates in any way who were very narrowly themselves. So it was a bit of an idea of how can we be more broadly ourselves and, and make that okay? Because in, in many contexts, you know, we are all sort of um, benefiting from, but also suffering under narrow labels. Um, and perhaps we can free that up a little bit more. Um, and getting back to the oboe, the only way that the kind of synthesizers could solve this problem in the end, they were building in more and more overtones. They were building in the sound of the intake of breath that a human being makes when they're about to play a note on the oboe. And in the end, they realized the only way they could get a true, ref, uh, you know, um, true version of that was actually recording live sounds. So there's something sort of deeply human about how that noise is produced. Um, and of course, you know, different oboe players on the same oboe will produce different tones as well. So I think there was a um, a metaphor that allowed us to explore themes of different labels, themes of plurality, um, and perhaps how we can bring more of ourselves to work on occasion. Um, so what I particularly like there. And Rick, you were going to share share one that stood out for you as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to share a story which is about, um, about building on this idea of uh, you have a dialogue, you have a conversation, and, you've, and some patterns, like uh, uh, not the pattern in uh, the way that someone's talking, but the overarching communicative pattern uh, is working out in a way that might be less helpful in the times where we're living. When, when complex challenges, of course, needs to have multiple perspectives, you need to explore things, you need to have something called uh, polyvocality, which is also like a, a music term, many voices, many voices coming from different sides and they all play into uh, the, the the sound of, of a team, for instance. But well, sometimes uh, what might be happening, and I find that a lot, and uh, Simon did too, is that we have more like um, one monologue and lots of silence, uh, or uh, or a serial monologues, all kind of monologues, uh, but not really the dialogue, not really someone saying something and then someone's picking it up, building on that, you know, all kind of diverse ideas that are helpful in a good conversation. Um, now, how do you do that in practice? Uh, when, for instance, I was, uh, uh, I would be working uh, around dialogue, and I would, uh, uh, and there's there's someone coming in. Uh, uh, it was uh, I remember one situation we talked about that in in the book was a guy who was coming in. And he started to talk, and he started to talk and think out loud, like I'm doing right now. But he was not thinking about the rest because, well, maybe we should do this and this and that, and some pressure from the market, you know. So. He felt like a huge responsibility to keep on talking. But then um, at a certain moment, other people wanted to try to say something and they just uh, took a breath. But when they <laughs> when they wanted to start to talk again, the monologue of uh, the first people person in charge was already going on. So we couldn't stop himself. Well, we wanted to work around uh, how can you get more diversity in this dialogue? 
So then I shared a story, and this story, I'm going to fire up the guitar again, is about John Coltrane. He's a, he's a saxophone player, but it's more like the principal how it's working. When you're playing jazz, for instance, what you're doing mm. is you're taking turns. So for instance, I might be playing uh, something like this. And for time purposes, this is 12 bars, and it's going to be repeating all over and over again. And everyone's got some time to share their stories. In jazz, also the bass player, the drummer, uh, everyone's taking turns and embellishing on the melody and playing on, riffing on the theme, which from design thinking perspective simply means we don't have an overarching view uh, already. We're going to co-construct our meaning by sharing our ideas. Okay, so mm. this is just happening in jazz. But well, John Coltrane was a wonderful uh, uh, saxophone player, but when he would start to play, he would play something like this, uh, just translate to uh, saxophone. We hear our now. And then you would think, okay, now Simon's going to be playing on his flugelhorn. And Simon's already ready with the flugelhorn, but I think, like John Coltrane, da, 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 take another round. Okay, you can do that. Da, 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 da. Simon thinks, okay, another round. He's ready. And then John is playing. Da, 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 and we get there. Da, 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 and he just went on and on and on. That's not jazz. So then Miles Davis said, come on, uh, John, why are you always, why, why don't you stop? Why don't you hand it over to someone else? And John, he met well, and he just said, oh, just can't find a place where to stop. <laughs> I just, when I'm there, I have to keep on playing. And then Miles said, well, I got a suggestion, just take the horn out of your mouth. So, so we tried that, like, and then we, and he knew where the ending was. You always know, you know where you are in the scheme. And then silence, and then Simon, with his wonderful style, started to play. Really, really subtle, you know. And then we told that story, just take the horn out of your mouth. That's the metaphor. So then we shared that with that group, and we shared that story. And what are you doing? And you... He meant well, so what would happen if, for instance, you, the person who's just in charge and sharing, going into this monologue, just just hold back and wait and just wait, like silence is in music, and wait till something emerges. And then when you think, I'm responsible after, no, 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 wait, <laughs> no, 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 leave it here. Yeah, but no, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah, but oh, no, 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 wait, till someone says, maybe, and then we got a voice coming up that was silence normally, and that opens it up. Now this framing is is one in for one. It's like an easy way. It's a metaphor, something around it that, can, that you can use. But also you have some language that works. So people were working on that, and then once in a while, when they were like working on that and it didn't work out immediately, like uh, it could be, then someone said, "Ah, oh, come on, uh, Hank. If it's Hank, just take that horn out of your mouth." <laughs> you know, and then it's a playful way of being. Uh, reflexive about uh, about what might be happening and uh, well there might be very many many methods but I don't know those I think this works uh, mm. really swell and I'm sure I'm sure you're probably spotting connections as well I mean someone's mentioned coordinated management of meaning but you know it's, it's yeah. a way of pattern interruption in, in that way and there's lots of dialogic thinking that that kind of gets at that idea from different directions, really. But it was certainly we, we got there by word, sound as well. Mm -hmm. If there's one word you uh, you could remember, then it's erp. What is an erp? That's in CMM. We have something called unwanted repetitive patterns. An erp. So if there's unwanted repetitive patterns, we also have one wanted repetitive patterns. So just uh, spot mm. spot the erps. Exactly. And yeah, so in some contexts, you know, a, a leader feeling they need to occupy 90% of the share of voice might not always be the, the most helpful pattern, for example. So just a kind of couple of couple of routes in there. And there's a lot more of those. And, you know, some of those are a bit more systemic in nature. And some are a bit more kind of personal. Um, but there, Rick, that's, that's a bit of an overview, isn't it? I don't know if you wanted to say a word or two just by way of signposting that. Yeah, uh, well, what sharing. you might notice uh, is it is about complexity. It's about building on uh, on on, uh, on Shaw, building on uh, uh, Sharma, building on Stacy. They all start with an S somehow. Uh, it, it is about playing with patterns. And if we think of the idea of melody, harmony, rhythm, and tone, you might think of how do these connect, but also what could we do as a working in practice 
um, example to play with these things. So what we did is we uh, just uh, thought, uh, collected ideas. Hey, Simon, what did you do around that? What did you do around that? And then we thought, oh, I did this thing with a counter tune. Like I had this session where I was talking with, uh, where we're having a, um, what was it, launching a new um, IT system and people were sharing it, but it was more like get buy-in for a vision instead of being inviting in the counter tune. So that was one story. So we came up with different, different uh, stories. Uh, the one that I shared right now is in Melody in Teams, like the, the story of uh, uh, take a horn out of your mouth and uh, I don't know exactly where we got the Fourier thing. Bringing out the overtones, I think. In, yeah, oh yeah, bringing out the overtones. It's just a strong tone. What, what's important here, this is for us, us we are not uh, guys coming up with models. That's a very important thing also in the work of complexity of Stacy and Shaw. Like uh, we don't, uh, if you work like this, you're not looking for starting with a model, starting with this is uh, the tool set, these are the five leadership rules that might be helpful. Uh, that in a way doesn't work. That's also around the work of uh, Ralph Stacy, which is very interesting, I think. You just come up with something from another world uh, in this, this now it's uh, music, and you, you see it as an utterance. It's just an utterance. It's this, hey, I was thinking about this. And then you invite people in to see, to build on what we did in the beginning, what happens when you have your own organizational challenges, but leave them there, leave them in your mind and then listen to these stories and just watch what connections emerge. And this is from a methodology from what learning is very, very important and makes quite a difference. Uh, there's lots a difference with uh, other ways of working in, in consulting, which often uh, people expect often, often some clarity and some certainty and some recipes. Well, the whole thing in, in, uh, in organizational life and life in general is that you cannot predict anything. You can have a clue, you can, you can create a direction, you can set a stage like Miles Davis was doing. So th this is an overview of different uh, ways of how you can look at those. And we can come up with different ones but the most important thing, when, when you might start reading these, maybe people uh, did and you, you know it's free, you can start to browse it, what would emerge for you? And then that's not right or wrong, there's no right or wrong answers, but what might emerge for you when you hold your own challenges uh, uh, in the light of just this uh, selection, this little selection of, uh, of practices? Mm. Yeah, and then that's in the appendix of the download as well. It's a bit of an overview of some of the practical examples that you can, you can dip into. Um, but I think we should probably try and try and get you sharing with each other in a moment. But um, the final the final kind of creative constraint we set ourselves, which you'll see particularly in those central four chapters, is um, we both realised you know, connections that we have. We've both got ancient copies of Grove's Dictionary of Music on our shelves from when we were um, well behaved schoolboys. Um, and we thought uh, in the spirit of sort of riffing on a theme, the idea of theme and variation as a musical structure, um, we would begin each of those chapters with part of the, the definitions from Grove um, of melody, harmony, rhythm or tone, um, and just see what connections we made with that. We sort of assumed very heavily um, that somewhere in this, this dictionary definition, there would be um, inspiration, um, uh, information, meaning, um, something that, uh, that, that's there to, teach us something about um, the organizational challenges that we were working with in our practice. So we're gonna ask you to do the same thing in a moment. I'm just going to drop something into chat and let me concentrate so I don't uh, mess this up because um, there's just gonna be a copy of this slide um, and a, a few words of a brief that you might want to download as I'm talking. Um, right, so let me just do this. So it's so just two PowerPoint slides, which will hopefully come through. Uh, and it's called Taos Quotes, imaginative title that we came up with. And what we're going to do in a moment is to send you into groups um, with these four quotes as inspiration. Um, uh, we're going to put you into sort of trios and fours, I think. So kind of small groups, you've got enough time to kind of share and connect. Um, perhaps have a look at those four quotes and just choose one quite intuitively um, to work with and assume, believe in the, the, the process of serendipity and the process of metaphor, um, that this quote has something to tell you um, about an organizational challenge that you're working with. Place the quote next to your uh, lived experience and watch the sparks fly. 
Um, so you know, be a bit playful with that, with this framework of melody, harmony, rhythm and, and tone and see what which part of that quote somehow says something or speaks to something about an organisational challenge you're facing. It might be the organisation you work with. It might be an organisation you're consulting to. Um, it might be uh, uh, yeah, an, a, a club or a society that you're part of as well. Um, so hopefully that's dropped into the chat. Um, if you could download that, and if at least one of you um, in, in your groups has that, that would be helpful. Alternatively, feel free to kind of take a quick screenshot um, of this screen. And a screenshot of this screen. In fact, what I will also do is I'll put this directly into yeah, the chat. Good. Belt and braces, as they say, just so you've got those to respond to. Um, and we'll place you into small groups for a good sort of, you know, 25 minutes or so. Um, so you get an opportunity to play with those. Uh, consider those quotes alongside uh, an organisation that you're challenging, you're facing at the moment and uh, see where that takes you. Let me just um, reassign people and we'll open the groups now. Hopefully a pop up should appear on your screen. Um, and yeah, connect with one another as best you can. And then we'll have a bit of a conversation about where you went in your conversations and then obviously any questions um, after we've done that. And one, one remark, if you're now visiting and you're not maybe working as a consultant or something, uh, you can also think about what might be inspirational around uh, things happening in your family, things happening in your, it's, it's more like how, uh, social groups. Uh, so any connections that work, you will, you will, you might find. I won't, won't predict anything because this is about. I cannot predict anything, but uh, you might find that there are all kinds of connections. So it's not only the organization thing. You can play uh, in, in any other direction that feels okay for you. Okay, welcome back. Um, just thought it'd be lovely to to kind of hear a, a sense really of where you went in your conversations. Um, I mean, no particular order. I'm sure you benefit from hearing from from one another. But where did you go? Which quotes interested you? Any insights into anything you were thinking about or working on? We had we've got some three groups. So, I mean, Greg and Hans. I think you lost someone along the way, but I don't know if Anna, either of you Anna, feels. Ilana. Ah, there you go. Okay, good. You're back, yeah. Ilana. That's right. My breakout rooms have come unscrambled, but you're you're all here. So, Greg, Hans, Ilana, where did you, where did you go? Well, we, we all had a, our experiences. Greg and I both had experiences with some music. Uh, actually, Greg with playing music. Me and my, my partner plays music during uh, work. And we, I used the metaphor. I used the word rhythm. And uh, we were asked to bring a different tone in the company. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, when I was browsing through, through the book, I, I looked at the notes and uh, the harmony. To, uh, this is something that I will I will work on, um, and Ilana did more of a visual thing, so also a, a different uh, uh, sensory uh, approach. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, 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 it's it's nice. It's work. It works. You know, it's um, it has its challenges, but so does staying in the old metaphor. So uh, <laughs> exactly. So so that you're all you're all using that almost that artistic way of knowing to go back to that original frame in your in your daily practice? Um, well, you know, off and on, I, I, I use all kinds of metaphors, and, but I, yeah, I, I, I have a particular, I was just working with this one for the, for the past few months when I, uh, when the book hit my email. Mm. So, and, and what was the, what was the new harmony or tone that, that was needed in the organization without revealing anything you can't reveal, but? Um, well, they weren't they weren't speaking so much to each other as about each other, if if at all, and mm. you know, bitchy, whiny, complaining, rather than uh, constructive, you know, uh, problem problem uh, or solution focused. Mm. Yeah, so there's a lot of emotion there, and sometimes that that leads you to a kind of conversational tone, which is more about reacting than responding. It sounds like people yeah. triggering each other rather than sort of listening listening well. Yeah, or just giving up, you know, just just being blown off too too many times and just not even tried a, a, anymore. Mm. Yeah, and sometimes if you, yeah, thinking I guess of an ensemble improvisation, it could be the idea of well, I'm I'm fed up trying to yeah. talk to these other people. I'm just going to play my part. Yeah, I'm just going to yeah, everyone else can do their own thing. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And be the victim. Yeah. My goodness, it sounds like um, sensitive work. 
It is very, very much so. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. And anything else? Any other reflections from from that group that you wanted to add, Greg or Ilana? Um, well, a lot came up in quite a short time. So rather than just sort of repeat it, or I would just like to focus on one thing, which you guys point out in your in the book. I really like the book, incidentally. Um, I think it's congratulations. It's something that needs needs to be written about, and it's uh, it really drew me in. Um, and that is that um, I think Hans and I in particular were faced with rather conventional uh, bunch of senior executives who have had the same, the same way of talking to each other for a very long time. Um, and um, it's quite easy uh, as a facilitator, you, you, you can get drawn in on that and start, sort of mirror it. And there's a kind of collusion that goes on. Mm. So. So we, we often think about what we, as, as it were, do with the client. But um, as someone who's into music but doesn't actually play anything, I do use music quite a bit, first of all, to change myself. So if I feel that there's some sort of transformational change needed within a group, some changing, I might, before even meeting them, listen to some music and not analyze it very much, but just experience what it's done to me. And it puts me in a slightly different kind of posture in relation to the team. And then I can more easily, uh, I can use music in the session to try to help them uh, explore silences more often, for which I find Beethoven is a great godsend just a bit of Beethoven and you can talk to them with them about silence and also um, uh, we just um, had a problem with someone who kept leaving the meeting and so I, I, w I used uh, the, the end of a Mars Davis track of um, not kind of blue, blue moods, um, I think it was either Alone Together or Nature Boy where there's that wonderful long fade and just got them to appreciate that actually, uh, if you keep leaving the room, meeting to go to another meeting and then coming back, you keep missing out on the fade. And more importantly, people are missing out on some of your leadership behavior. What does it say to them if you feel you can keep abandoning them? So, um, you know, we're not, we're not, those ideas around a little bit. Mm, lovely. And yeah, I was thinking of that ISO principle um, when you were talking about sort of almost changing yourself, almost kind of doing your own yeah. your own music therapy to sort of shift that stance. And it's interesting you mentioned silence because my my mind went to sort of you know short meditative practices and grounding, which you know sometimes I if I know I'm feeling a bit hectic about stepping into a group that is a bit hectic, then you know, it's not quite music, but it's it's a a different auditory experience just to sort yeah. of pay attention to, to yeah. silence or sound yeah. So. yeah thank you um perhaps other, other groups um you know, malisa villa terry alex i don't want to kind of force everyone to talk but it would be lovely just to get a sense of the different directions your conversations went in anything to share there that you feel happy to share i, I can start if, you, if you'd like and the rest will join in that <laughs> um, I'm sure. Uh, so we looked at harmony and and moving from a definition of what we thought harmony was, and that was about the smoothness and everyone getting along and that, to the harmony of embracing the diversity and, and that real strong shift towards what arrives um, and, and honoring all of that and everybody in that. Um, yeah, and so the discussion went to different sort of types of music and that, but then it's really hard to hold the space for for the voice to to be to be voiced and and how to create how to create the types of questions that open up discussion and that invite people in to to tell their story, but starting in from an appreciative stance as. Um, is that starting point. And the question that I came out with 
for me is how might we how might we more effectively invite people in and particularly on what we've all experienced on Zoom is, is that it's sometimes really challenging to step in to say what it is you want to say and then also to respect when people don't want to say anything. Mm. So it's, it's sitting in that slight discomfort of not everybody has had their say and yet perhaps respecting that not everybody wants to have their say. So that's sort of where we, that's mm. some of the our group and I don't know if people would add in. I like the idea of, yeah, it's allowing space for people to step into, not dragging them, kicking and screaming into it. It's quite a nice, nice way of thinking about that balancing act. But yeah, others, if you feel you'd like to add to that. I think, oh, yeah. I think Sevilla, with her work that she's done in Africa, would be lovely to hear. Um, right. Uh, <laughs> there's so many, so many thoughts that are flooding my mind right now. Um, however, I think it's, um, I would like to pick up on um, uh, other group members' perspectives that, um, that cross between um, music and visual arts and other, other art forms. Um, and that certainly goes back to the significance of uh, what Marley said, that there's enough room open to allow all these possibilities to present themselves and express themselves in full. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it sometimes takes courage to let in sounds that may not be familiar to us. Um, mm. In many cultures, uh, the quarter notes, for instance, <laughs> are sometimes <laughs> um, a bit difficult to get get used to hearing uh, to begin with. Yet, if you hear uh, the sounds of like the Lady Smith Mombasa from South Africa, you know, the perfect harmony and the rhythms, then your appreciation can only grow. And mm. I think we are all richer by that. Mm, that's lovely. Yeah, if, you're, if your frame is... 12 semitones and that's all you can appreciate you're you're poorer somehow than if you yeah, allow your tonal world more more compartments that's a nice nice yes. metaphor, nice image yeah and, and say like the balinese gamelan for instance right mm. you know a friend's mother used to call that torture music <laughs> <laughs> Until you, you know, basically <laughs> um, have enough time to understand and appreciate it, then mm. the beauty actually emerges and enrich your life. Uh, and, uh... I think it's also important to uh, recognize, um, I think Martin, uh, Simon, you, you said that really well, that, uh, you know, it, 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 the principle of... Uh, just opening a safe space and let whatever come in come rather mm. than dragging people um, to it uh, because uh, that sometimes includes uh, the necessity to be quiet, mm. the, the right to be silent. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to recognize the difference. Who is in charge mm. of whether it's um, a vibrant tone or complete silence? Mm. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Mm, I, I'm thank sure you. Uh, Terry, with her visual arts background, 
and Alex, um, you know, have a lot of reflections also to share. Mm. Do you feel free to take up that invitation, Terry and Alex, or, or leave it up to you. You're, you're on mute if you are trying um, to jump again. in there, sorry. So just, I've never been to Africa, but I do recall watching a video a presenter showed us and someone made a comment, you know, when one of the men moved into the circle, the women musicians and singers, someone made a comment, what a show off. And I saw it completely different where I just saw him being moved almost by the earth you know, despite himself, you know, he was almost like he had no choice. He was just pulled and caught up in the rhythm and the music, which was so beautiful. So it was interesting, you know, to hear his perception and, and what I perceived. Mm. Thank you. So, Rick Marlene, I think you lost how along the way, but I wonder, is this already... Where did, where did you go in your group? I don't know. Marlene, are you still here? Because I don't see a, a camera. Okay, I can, yeah, Joe had to go. Uh, uh, but, well, I just hopped in and I, uh, Joe showed, shared some ideas on coaching and how he actually li was like, um, when I hopped in, he was like doing this. With his eyes closed, he didn't even notice I was coming in. <laughs> like and uh, and that was like in a musical way and he really shared wonderful ideas about uh, how uh, for instance he talked about noise and about that you can have uh, and Marlene uh, expanded on that that you can have ugly noise and beautiful noise and that when you are playing that you might hear something that sounds like noise but when you get used to it you can make a distinction between this is helpful and this might be less helpful Mm. Uh, and um, what you said, Terry, uh, uh, well, it's, it's all um, the first impression that you have of something. Oh, that's a show off. <laughs> but that's your, your cultural framing, you know. And when you're opening up to that and you know, okay, but I can look at this in a different way. And then I see different things. And I let myself in to, to, to allow the whole situation to change my perception of that situation. And you help people to understand that that is such an important part of being alive and being learning with each other, then you have a good, a good starting point. Mm. So this is, we were playing with things around that and also with Marlene, because Marlene is not working in a coaching uh, environment, but working with a choir. And she shared a beautiful idea about you start to sing and then you create the harmony and that that's your home. You know, you create, it's a loop like, um, if I'm just singing, if I'm singing a uh, harmony with someone, uh, in a band and someone is singing the first voice, first voice, and then I sing the second voice, I can only, uh, I'm not a very good singer with that, but what I do is I listen to what emerges. I'm mm -hmm. not listening to my voice. I'm not listening to the voice of the other one. I'm listening to what emerges from these voices mingling and something emerges from that. And that helps you to fine tune it. Mm -hmm. so, so in a choir means. you create something you create the context that again is the context that gives you uh, a, a holding space to take the next step mm. uh, an eye on the time as well and i think we want to allow you some silence before your next meetings as well but the, the next step is we did want to sort of say a little bit about where we got to because um you know, writing this down was never an attempt to be definitive or to kind of be a summary of anything it was more just an experiment in its own right really so it threw up more questions than than answers perhaps but you mentioned noise there rick i mean we set ourselves the creative constraint of melody harmony rhythm or tone but noise would be a fascinating thing to explore as well so um in resonance you know there's lots of different things that, that perhaps you can take away and, and play with really so our, i guess our hope is that people will find their way to to this bit of writing and perhaps you know be inspired to to take it twist it you know play with it in, in different ways as well and you mentioned that the kind of dancing and movement as well and interesting that's that came up quite a lot for us as well i mean our, our example was Thelonious Monk the um, composer and pianist you know um, would often sort of leave the keyboard and sort of circle around and used to get in trouble for it because people were well, I'm, I'm here to hear you play not see you kind of circle around but I suspect at some you know deep level that connection between 
the embodied, the somatic um, and the kind of the auditory is, I mean, it's, it must be deeply ingrained. So we started asking ourselves questions around, you know, if we if we deal mostly with the visual in organisations and we're arguing that perhaps we should spend some time with the herd, um, you know, perhaps the, the next layer down to be integrated is the embodied, really. Yeah. What would a, a sort of deeply embodied organisational practice look like? You know, what would organisation as dance reveal? Um, and we haven't given that much time at all in what we've written down, but it might be what we what we think about next, really. Um, so, Dawn, I don't know if there's anything you, you want or need to say by way of closing, but it's a couple of minutes to the half hour and you know, perhaps in the spirit of letting people have some silence before the Yeah, before I just want to, I want to take, yeah, mm. that's great. Yeah, so thank you so much, Simon and Rick, for your book and for sharing your um, examples with us today. And I uh, want to thank everyone for participating and coming to this dialogue with the author and um, be looking for others. I hope you're on our mailing list. If you're not, go to our website. You can join our mailing list and hear about updates and new things that are coming. So um, thank you again. And, and I know you want to do some silence or maybe Rip will play a little bit. Oh, just, just allow people to have to log out and have a minute before whatever it is they've got at half past. Yeah. It's a rare, a rare treat, really. So. Yeah, and if anybody think. wants to come off mic and just say one word of how you're feeling or what's resonating with you right now, that would be helpful too. I'm, I'm going to disrupt this pattern a little bit by adding one sentence. What's doing to me, Hans and Greg, this is really uh, helpful for me because this is in a way presenting a book, but now I meet people who already read it and do something with it. And that's very, very important for me because that's what we're doing it for. But I haven't met many people because it's just out that tell us I read that and I use it and I learn from that. And that's that's I'm really happy with that because that's really inspiring about what I'm trying, what we're trying to do with the work. So thank you for that. All right. Let's stay in touch. Yeah, I think so. Okay, going yeah. back, back to Dawn's in, uh, invitation, just one word you wanted to say. Yeah, I, I'm, I have more than one, but thank you. Um, I'm, I'm working in the embodiment space. So <laughs> the, uh, the expression of, of voice through movement for me, and I come from South Africa, so I relate very much to the example that Terry brought in, is maybe that was his, his best voice. Mm. Thanks, Mamis. Om, we have Om, with the original original sound from Hans. <laughs> Lovely. Anyone else? Provide something. You can leave any any time you want. <laughs> I'll never stop. I'll never take that horn out of my mouth. <laughs>